Hey everybody, so it's Sunday. I don't usually have a video today, uh, and that's because this is a special week. This is spoilers week. Uh, the entire set of Fate Reforged has been spoiled, and so I'm going to throw my hat into the ring and do a set review. Uh, it's no big surprise. You've seen the title already, but it is time for... The Manalink Set Review. Welcome to the very first uh, Mana League set review week. Uh, there's not going to be any Wacky Wednesday, no Spiky Saturday, no drafting, no magic playing at all. It's just going to be six videos worth of set reviews. Uh, today you're going to get the white review, tomorrow you'll get blue, on Tuesday you'll get black, Wednesday red, Thursday green, Friday artifacts, colorless, uh, gold, and just sort of final conclusions. Oh, and also uh, a single land. Um, so yeah. Before we jump into the actual cards, we're going to go over a few disclaimers. So first off, disclaimer number one, I have not played with these cards. Uh, there's a couple of reprints that I've played with, but otherwise I have never touched these cards. I have not printed out proxies and tested them. I have no experience with these cards actually being played. The benefit is that this is going to be a small set. Uh, Fate Reforged will be added into cons for draft and sealed. Uh, so I do know what the format looked like before Fate Reforged comes out. So I can make some uh, uh, potentially uh, better predictions of how things will go as opposed to if this was just uh, a brand new fresh set, in which case uh, uh, predictions and ratings can be all over the place and can be completely wrong. So that's disclaimer number one. I haven't played with these cards. Uh, disclaimer number two, this is a limited review only. Uh, as you probably know, I play 99% limited on this channel, 100% uh, if you consider Momir Fig to be limited, uh, which you may as well. I do play constructed in paper a little bit, uh, but I am in no way, shape, or form a deck builder. Uh, I can tune decks, uh, I'm decent with a sideboard, but just building a deck from scratch is not one of my strong points, and so I'm not very strong with looking at a card and saying, oh yes, of course, this goes into Abzan Aggro and it's a, an absolute A+, plus and etc. I can make a good guess as to what might be a good constructed card, but uh, I'm just not familiar with that. So these ratings that I'll be giving, everything I'll be talking about is about draft and sealed only. Uh, so if I take a card that you think is going to be $30 and played in every deck in standard, uh, a B, that's because it's not that good in draft. Uh, Thoughtseize, for example, Thoughtseize would have been, I don't know, a C maybe? It's just not a good card in Limited at all. Uh, but of course, in Constructed, you're looking at an A, A plus card. Uh, so yes, this will be Limited only. And then the final disclaimer, disclaimer number three, this is my personal first glance opinions on these cards. Uh, I am not going to be like some pros and say this is an A+, plus, and if you disagree, you're dumb and you don't know how to play Magic. Because this is just my opinions. This is how I'm going to be walking into my first draft, my first sealed event, and uh, viewing these cards. This is what I'm going to do for the first week. Uh, my views will change, my ratings will change as I get experience with these, and my ratings are open for discussion. If you disagree, let me know. You know, uh, This is definitely a time to discuss and get sort of a crowdsourcing opinion on these ratings. I'm just one of many voices. Uh, I'm sure you do know a number of other uh, set reviews that are quite popular, and I, of course, read them too. Uh, but yeah, I'm just looking to throw my opinion in uh, just to help out the discussion as a whole as to what these cards may be. But enough with disclaimers, we're going to jump into the actual review. Alright, so today we're going to start with uh, white, and it's not going to be split into commons and uncommons and then rares later. It's just going to be alphabetical order, uh, starting with Abzan Advantage and ending with, let's see what's down here at the bottom, Word Scale Dragon. Uh, we're just going to go start to finish. Uh, I'm going to read out the card. You'll see the card up on screen so that uh, you can keep reading it over and remember what it's uh, uh, doing while I talk about it. And we're going to start with Abzan Advantage. So Abzan Advantage is an instant for one and a white. It says target player sacrifices an enchantment, bolster one. This is our first uh, experience with bolster. This is a new mechanic in Fate Reforged. It's the new Abzan mechanic. Uh, and the reminder text here says choose a creature with the least toughness among creatures you control and put a plus one plus one counter on it. So bolster will always be bolster X, uh, some sort of number. 
And that just simply means that when this spell happens, when this creature comes down, whenever bolster happens, you look at your battlefield and you figure out which creature has the least toughness. And you put X number of plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, if you're tied for the number of uh, creatures with toughness, so if you have two, uh, you know, one ones, you choose the one one that you put the counter on. You can't split it up, uh, and it's not a case of you know a one one becomes a, a two two, and then the next bolster counter, if it was bolster two, goes on that previous one one. They do all just go on the creature that has the lowest power and toughness. So, anyways, absent advantage, instant one white target player sacrifices an enchantment and bolster one. This is a sideboard card, I think, uh, a sideboard only card, uh, because Bolster 1, I just don't think is worth a card. Uh, there's not that many enchantments that, uh, in cons format, I've really been all that concerned about. Uh, in fact, I can't really name one. I mean, there's the Ascendancies, but I don't typically care when my opponent has one of those in play. Uh, this set you'll see has a fair number of more enchantments, uh, a rare cycle of enchantments that actually are not that bad and maybe better than some of the ascendancies. Um, but enchantment hate just doesn't seem that important in uh, in cons block, and I don't think it's going to be that important in fate reforged and uh, cons block. So yeah, I think you just put this in the sideboard. You don't take it very high at all. You take this as one of your last picks or. You know, if there's nothing else in the pack in the color that you uh, will play, maybe you'll take this just in case you'll see one of these enchantments. It's the same as a race. It's the same as naturalize. Uh, it almost makes me wonder if they were really worried about Theros, and if they were really worried about there just being too much enchantments, and they loaded this setup and uh, uh, favor or cons up with uh, enchantment removal. So it is just enchantment removal plus that bolster one. I'm not a big fan of Bolster, and you'll see this come up a lot. Um, I view it kind of like life gain. Uh, I like it if it comes with something really good, but I don't necessarily like it just by itself. And in this case, since you're probably very rarely going to be using uh, this as enchantment removal, it is essentially just Bolster 1. The reason I'm not a big fan of Bolster is that you don't get to choose where it goes. It's going to go on something that has the lowest toughness, and you're going to know what that is 99% of the time. You know, your opponent maybe could respond to the spell by uh, killing the lowest toughness creature, but that probably doesn't seem like a good play. So you are going to know where it goes, but you don't get to choose where it goes. And I think in a lot of cases, it's not going to be nearly as good as you think to bolster uh, just by itself. Uh, you will see a lot of cards uh, coming up in this set where it's something awesome and bolster one, or something awesome and bolster two, or bolster every turn, or bolster every time something happens. I'm a much bigger fan of that, but just bolster one by itself, or essentially by itself with this card, I'm just not a big fan of, so I'm going to give it a D-. Uh, I should actually talk about the grades. Uh, they're going to be the sort of uh, elementary school letter grades A through F. Uh, I don't have a consistency rating, uh, so I don't, you know, I can't say that every single D minus is this type of card, or every single C plus is this type of card. Uh, I will try to get more consistent as I do more set reviews, uh, but these are just sort of my uh, uh, arbitrary grades, if you will. Generally, I can say that Ds are going to be sideboard or bad cards. C and above are going to be cards that you're going to play. Uh, C's are probably going to be cuttable in a lot of situations. Um, and then up from there are going to be cards that you're going to play. Uh, and at that point, the ratings really kind of uh, start to differentiate just based on how highly you would take the card. F's, of course, you shouldn't take, you shouldn't play. If you have one in your pool, it's because it was the last pick. But so yeah, I'm giving this card a D-. minus. It seems like just a pure sideboard card to me. The bolster one just doesn't do anything for me. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to be taking this card, and I'm not going to be playing it unless I see something super, super, super deadly uh, on the enchantment side on my opponent's uh, battlefield. So the next card is Abzan Rune Mark, and this is the first of a cycle. You're going to see one of these uh, for every color review that we do this week. Uh, there's going to be one for each clan. The white one is Abzan Rune Mark, two and a white for an enchantment aura. And it says enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two. This is what all the rune marks do. They all enchant a creature. They all give that creature plus two, plus two. 
Then each rune mark gives an ability if you control uh, a permanent of the other two guild, or sorry, not guild, clan colors. So this one says enchanted creature has vigilance as long as you control a black or a green permanent. So as long as you control a non-white Abzan permanent. I'm not a big fan of this. Uh, I don't play Siegecraft. Siegecraft is plus two, plus four for, uh, I believe it's three white. Um, I'm just not a big fan of auras that just pump the, uh, uh, the power and toughness up a little bit. Uh, I was okay with, I think it was called Feral Invocation in Theros block because it was plus two, plus two, but it had flash. So it was a combat trick that also stuck around. But just a flat out boring old cast at sorcery speed aura is not that exciting to me. So this really comes down to the ability. Is the ability that's granted in addition to the plus two, plus two really amazing? And I don't think this is. Vigilance is never quite as good as you think it is. Uh, you often think of all those awesome situations where Vigilance is going to be great because you'll get to attack and you'll get to hold it back and block. But if you think about that, in what situation are you going to be attacking into your opponent's battlefield confidently and they're going to be confidently attacking back into you? Probably not that many situations. Uh, vigilance is okay if it's on an evasive creature it's okay if it's on a really awesome creature um it's okay i wouldn't even say it's okay if you give your entire team vigilance because brave the sands of course was not that good i'm just not a big fan of vigilance i'm not a big fan of paying all that much extra for it and paying two white plus an entire card slot in your deck just doesn't seem very good and of course this only has vigilance if you have a black or a green permanent down keep in mind that lands are colorless uh, i do expect someone out there somewhere to uh say that oh i have a black permanent because i have a swamp but a swamp doesn't have a color keep that in mind so yeah i'm not very high on this card at all i'm going to give it a d uh slightly higher than absent advantage but uh still not a card i'm going to look to take still not a card i'm going to look to play uh it barely stays out of F range for me personally, just because I really, really, really hate auras unless they're really powerful. There are some uh, in this set that I'm going to give a higher rating to. Uh, I like the abilities a bit more. I like what the aura does a little bit more, uh, but this unfortunately just is not one of them, so it's going to get a D. Next up, we have our first creature. Uh, we have an Abzan Sky Captain. For three and a white, it's a creature bird soldier. Uh, there's a surprising number of soldiers in this set along with cons, although there's no support for them. Uh, not like warriors, of course. So this is a creature bird soldier for three and a white. It's a 2-2, and it has flying. So, uh, of course, a sky captain would be up in the air. Of course, a bird would be up in the air. It has flying, so it's a 2-2 flyer for four. And it's got something else. It also says, when Abzan sky captain dies, bolster two. So here we have bolster again. Uh, uh, on something at least. So instead of just being part of a spell, this bolster is actually on a creature. So if we take a look at this card uh, and get rid of bolster, it's a 2-2 flyer for 4. And that's not awful. You know, there's cards out there that are pretty similar. We pay uh, 4 for an Alabaster Kirin right now, and that's a 2-3 flyer with Vigilance. I'm not a big fan of Vigilance, um, so it's really the 2-3 that's decent. Uh, in that case, the Vigilance actually does help out a little bit because it can block morphs and things. But Absent Sky Captain, 2-2 uh, Flyer for 4. That seems okay. I wouldn't take it very highly. Um, I'd potentially look to cut it depending on how my deck is doing, but it's okay. Adding on Bolster 2 when it dies is actually pretty decent. Uh, I kind of like Bolster in this situation because this creature is going to stick around and when it gets too annoying for your opponent, your opponent's going to have to think about killing it. Either killing it in combat or killing it with a kill spell. And when they do, you're going to essentially keep this creature around. You're just going to throw it on top of another creature. Another creature is going to get the two power and two toughness that this guy provided already. So I'm actually pretty happy with this guy. Um, he's not a bomb. He's not a high pick, of course. Uh, I should actually mention, I forgot what, what the other cards are. Uh, these have all been common so far. Uh, I do need to talk about the rarity of these. So this is a common. You'll see it very uh, uh, regularly in your packs. 
So it's not going to be a high pick, but it's also going to be a pick that I'm probably not going to cut all that often. Four mana, two, two flyer in white seems fine to me. So I'm going to give it a solid C. C is kind of where I'll probably tend to put cards where, uh, you know, I'll take them, you know, fifth pick, seventh pick somewhere around there, probably not as high as fifth pick actually, but I'd be taking them when I've already kind of decided I want to be in that color, um, and they'll probably make the deck, but if there's other stuff, I'm perfectly okay with cutting them, so you can think of C as cuttable, um, so yeah, this just gets a C, I'm, I'm okay with it, I'm not amazed by it, uh, it's just kind of okay. Uh, but I am happy to see a bolster uh, ability on a creature. I'm happy to see bolster on something where I don't just go, eh, I don't want it, like I did with Absan Advantage. Next up, we have Erishin Cleric. It is one and a white for a creature human cleric at common, and it's a 1-3. So we're getting a 1-3 for one and a white, same as Jeskai Student in cons. So this has an ability, of course. It does something. It's more than just a 1-3. This says, when Erishin Cleric enters the battlefield, you gain three life. So turn two, you drop this guy down, he's going to block your morphs, and you're going to gain three life. That's actually not that great. Jeskai Student, I haven't been a fan of it. I've cut it almost every single time I've had it. I've only played it when I absolutely required another creature. Uh, and Jeskai Student, of course, was this, except it had prowess instead of gaining three life. Uh, I like gaining three life even less than I like prowess, and I'm not a big fan of prowess. So I don't like this card. Um, I don't think you want to pick this ever. Uh, I think you want to pick this when it's the last card in your color, and I think you want to cut it almost all the time. Uh, like Jeskai Student, you'll play this card when you need a creature. Uh, the draft hasn't gone well. You've missed out on creatures. You've missed out on playables. Something like that has happened, uh, and you're going to take this guy, and you're going to play him just because he's a body. Other than that, you don't want to take this guy. You don't want to play him. Three life gain, that's not going to be all that important. You're already going to get life gain off your tap lands. Uh, this just isn't going to be that good. So I'm going to give this a solid D. So white hasn't been going that well so far. We've gotten a D minus, a D, a C, and a D. So let's see if the next card can uh, maybe help us out here. So the next one is Avon Skirmisher, or sorry, Avon Skirmisher is the pronunciation of that. It is one white for a creature bird warrior at common. So this is our first warrior card that we've seen. Black White Warriors, of course, has been super dominant in draft. Uh, I've run into it far, far, far too often on this channel. But this is a bird warrior for one, and it's a one one. It's a bird, of course, so it flies. So we have a flying one one for one. I am never really a fan of 1-1s for 1. Um, we had in M15 Fugitive Wizard, I want to say it was called. It was a blue 1-1 for 1, uh, and it was awful. You would never play that card. This has flying, so it's ever so slightly better than that. So I'm not going to give this an F, but I am going to give it a D. Uh, this is not a card I want to be picking. Uh, it has flying, which is cool, but... This is Fate Reforged. Dragons are back on Tarkir. There are going to be dragons flying around. There are going to be Alabaster Kirins flying around. There are going to be Abzan Sky Captains flying around that we've already seen. And all of these guys kill Avon Skirmisher. All of them. So it's just not something that I'm interested in playing, and um, I'm not going to look towards playing this at all. Now, it does have the Warrior subtype, which isn't irrelevant in this set of course black white warriors being as dominant as it is but i still just don't think you really want this um you would have to have uh one of the chiefs to make this slightly better chief of the edge of course being better than chief of the scale to make this better um but i just don't think it's worth it black white warriors is going to actually have le uh, less access to the chiefs because you're only going to get two packs of cons instead of three um, so I just don't think that this is going to really have a place, unfortunately. So uh, solid D it is. Uh, I promise there will be some better grades coming soon. Uh, so the next card we have is Channel Harm. Uh, so it's not Channel Fireball, it's Channel Harm. Five and a white for an instant at Oncommon. Fairly expensive instant we have. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and permanent you control this turn by sources you don't control. 
if damage is prevented this way, you may have channel harm deal that much damage to target creature. So this is kind of removal uh, and maybe a fog. Um, you could use this if you were being attacked by a whole bunch of creatures. Uh, casting this would negate all of that damage and you'd get to throw it back at a single creature. Uh, if you had a creature that was going to get arrow stormed, you can prevent the arrow storm damage, as well as all other damage that's prevented that turn, which is pretty decent, uh, and just throw it back. Um, but I'm just not a fan of this, you know? Um, it's really expensive. It's five and a white um, for super conditional removal. You need to be waiting for your opponent to be doing something really bad to you in order to maybe do something bad to them, maybe. That's a l way too conditional to me. Um, I just don't like it. I don't like the fact that uh, a lot of this t uh, will be used as a fog. Uh, you know, you just do not play fog. Uh, we'll have that discussion someday. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it elsewhere, but you don't play fog. It's just not good. Uh, this is fog with a, a pretty good upside though, but it's also pretty expensive for what it is. Um, you, of course, might catch the Stray Arrow Storm. You might get the blowout that wins you the game, uh, but I do often feel that this will be a dead card in your hand. Uh, you'll be sitting with this card in your hand, and your opponent doesn't have any burn, or your opponent's not attacking you. And then this card could be anything else. This card could be an Avon Skirmisher, and you'd be happier with it being that than you would with it being Channel Harm. Um, it seems like a trap card to me. It seems like a card that people will read and think is incredible and will take it first pick if their rare isn't that awesome. Um, but I'm just not a fan of it, especially not for six mana. Um, I am going to give it a C minus. I'm not going to go into D territory just because I think it could be a 23rd card. I think it could be a card that you put in to have a playable. I don't think this is unplayable. I just think it's not nearly as good for the casting cost. Uh, so I'm going to put that at a C-. minus. All right, next up we have our first rare, and it, it is Citadel Siege. And this is a, uh, a cycle of sieges. There's one for each color. This is two white-white for an enchantment at rare. So this says, and all the other sieges also say, as Citadel Siege enters the battlefield, choose cons or dragons and each siege has a cons or dragons choice. Citadel Siege says if you choose cons, at the beginning of combat on your turn, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. If you choose dragons, at the beginning of combat on each opponent's turn, tap target creature that player controls. This I like. This I like quite a bit. Um, I'm not a huge fan of global enchantments. Uh, I think they need to be pretty good in order to, de in order to deserve a card slot. Um, but I think this is pretty good. Um, the cons ability is the one that I'm probably going to play the most. Um, it's not bolster 2, which is surprising. I almost would have expected uh, them to push the bolster mechanic and have this be bolster. But this is choose a target creature. You get to choose where those plus one plus one counters go. Uh, you know, if you have one creature out, this is essentially an anthem the first time you play it. Over a few turns, if you have a few creatures out, this will become an anthem. Uh, and if you don't want it to be just a, a blanket anthem, an anthem, of course, is a, a card that gives plus X plus X to all of your uh, team. Uh, if you don't want this to be an anthem, you can just pile those plus two plus two counters on one single creature. You can pile it on your flyer. You can pile it on your unblockable guy. You can do whatever you want with that. And I think this is just going to get out of control really, really, really fast. Uh, if you're in a stalled board, you're not going to be in a stalled board for long. Uh, you're going to start punching through quite a bit. The dragon's ability is a little bit less powerful. Uh, it's obviously meant to be the defensive uh, mode for this card. Uh, so on your opponent's uh, combat step, you're going to get to tap down whichever creature you really don't want them to be attacking with. Arguably, you could use that as an offensive ability because you could tap down their only blocker. Uh, but if they only have one blocker, you're probably already in a pretty good spot. 
Um, so this really does seem to be the defensive mode, but I'm okay with it as well. Uh, if you're behind, I'm perfectly okay dropping this down and just making their life uh, a little bit harder and making their uh, clock a little bit longer. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with this card. I'm gonna actually give it an A minus. Uh, I will first pick this card. Uh, there are certainly some uncommons that I could maybe pick over it, uh, but I'd be perfectly happy with picking this up and playing uh, probably an Abzan grindy game. I'd also be perfectly fine going sort of Jeskai flyers and just piling counters on my flyers. I like this card. I like it a lot. I'm going to first pick it for sure. Next up, we have another rare. Uh, this is Daghatar the Adamant. Uh, I have no idea the correct pronunciation on that, but we'll go with Dagatar. Uh, he is three and a white for a legendary creature human warrior at rare. Uh, this is another cycle. There's a lot of cycles in Fate Reforged. This is a cycle of cons. These are sort of the ancestors of the cons that we know from Cons of Darkir. So Dagatar is a human warrior, the warrior subtype, of course, always relevant. Uh, he has vigilance. Uh, and it says Dagatar the Adamant enters the battlefield with four plus one plus one counters on it. I forgot to mention he's a zero zero. So he dies without those counters. Thankfully, though, he is a four four for four. And he has an ability. All of the cons have an ability that uh, costs hybrid mana of the other two colors of their clan. So Dagatar is uh, one black green, black green hybrid. So that's three mana, uh, one black or green, black or green. Move a plus one, plus one counter from target creature onto a second target creature. So he can move things on from him. So he starts with four plus one, plus one counters. So he can go to a three, three, and he can help out a friend of his. He can go to a two, two. He can do whatever. He doesn't even tap for this as well. That's important to keep in mind. So if you have the mana, you can activate this multiple times a turn. Uh, this, of course, works pretty well with Outlast. Um, you know, if I have an outlasted guy with two counters, I can take a counter off and throw it on something else. Uh, and if it's an outlast lord, that's going to just spread those abilities out. Uh, I think outlast could get possibly even better with this set. There is a lot with uh, plus one plus one counters, and bolster, of course, continues that. The other important thing that uh, some people missed when they first read this card, and I'm sure other people will miss as well, is that it doesn't say target creature you control. It says move a plus one plus one counter from target creature. So if your opponent is putting plus one plus one counters on things, you can take them off. If your opponent has a, a hooded hydra, you can just start killing that hooded hydra with Dagatar, just taking pieces off and putting them on your creatures. Um, so definitely don't look past that. You can uh, sort of depower your opponent a little bit with this. That being said, he is a four, four for four. Um, he's not a bomb. I wouldn't play him and go, haha, I win the game now. I'd play him and say, things are, you know, going to get a little bit worse for you over time. So I'm going to keep him out of the A range, but just barely. I'm going to give him a B plus. I probably still would first pick this guy, um, but I'm not going to be quite as excited about something else. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go with a big, I'm going to go with a B plus. I think this could cause just a lot of headaches for your opponent. Uh, of course, the ability can be activated during combat, so it just screws up combat math as well. You're attacking with that 2-2 two -two and you have 6 mana open, that 2-2 two -two could become a 4-4. Four -four. Uh, and, you know, even after combat, you could pull those counters back onto Dagatar if you wanted to, or pull them back wherever you want. It's going to cause your opponent to have to think about an awful lot. So I'm pretty happy with this guy. B+, plus, um, definitely going to look forward to playing him for sure. All right, so next up we have Dragon Bell Monk. He's a two and a white creature human monk at common, and he's a two two. So he's a two two for three, so he's worse than a bear, so he must have some sort of abilities, right? Well, he does, he has vigilance and he has prowess. So we've talked about vigilance before. Um, we talked about it with uh, Abzan Rumark. I'm not a huge fan of vigilance. I like it to be on really nice creatures. I like it to be on flyers. I like it to be on creatures that have higher toughness than power. I don't necessarily care for a 2-2 Vigilance, especially not paying an extra mana for it. Now this creature also has prowess, but I don't really care for prowess in limited anyways. Um, prowess really seems to be more of a constructed mechanic, uh, and the reason for that is in order for prowess to be good, you need to have a lot of non-creature spells. And in limited, 
you need to have a lot of creatures. You win limited with creatures. You don't win it with non-creature spells. And so in order to make prowess more powerful, you have to make your deck less powerful in limited. So prowess has really fallen flat for me in limited anyways. Of course, there's really good things with it in uh, uh, constructed, and I think there's going to be even better things in constructed with it with this set. But I'm not a big fan of prowess in uh, limited. So I'm not a big fan of vigilance on little tiny guys. I'm not a big fan of prowess. So am I a big fan of this card? No. I'm not. Uh, it's essentially a bear for three to me uh, that sometimes maybe will be a little bit better for a turn. The other downside, of course, with prowess is a lot of instants that you have. You probably want to play on your opponent's turn, which means unless you're blocking with that prowess creature, you lose that prowess trigger. The prowess trigger just kind of goes away. So I'm not a huge fan of this. Um, a 2-2 two, two for 3, I'm going to give it a C-, minus. so it's in that cuttable range. It's in that range of, I don't want this i'll take it if it's the only card in my color and i'm gonna look for something else for the next two packs to get rid of this so c minus not that great you're not gonna fail if you take this card but uh i'm not gonna look to play it all that highly at all all right back to rares we're on to dragon scale general it's three and a white for a creature human warrior there are a lot of rare warriors in this set i've noticed uh, and it's a rare, as I just mentioned. Uh, so it's a 2-3 for 4. Uh, so probably going to be some sort of ability on this. And boy, is there ever. At the beginning of your end step, so at the end of each of your turns, bolster X, where X is the number of tapped creatures you control. That sounds good, but it also sounds a little bit uh, win more. Uh, you might have heard win more used before. Win more is basically, I'm already winning, and this makes me win more. Um, if you're not already winning, win more cards typically don't do that much for you. Um, or if you're behind, they often don't do anything for you. And I think this guy kind of fits into that. Um, in order to really use his ability, you want to be attacking with a good number of things. Now, you don't have to attack with him. He doesn't have to be tapped. Um, but you do need to be attacking with a lot of things or have a lot of cards that have uh, uh, tap abilities. So this guy's kind of okay with Outlast because your guys will be tapped if you're outlasting them. But you need to be in a situation where you're confidently attacking your opponent with a lot of creatures. You need to be in a situation where you're confidently tapping on your turn your blockers. And if you're confidently tapping your blockers on your turn, leaving yourself open to attacks, you should have already won the game, or you should be very, very, very close to winning the game. So I'm just not a huge fan of this guy. Now, that being said, the ability is still pretty splashy, and I can still see some incremental advantage out of it. Uh, if I'm in a board stall, I'm going to be pretty happy with this guy uh, outlasting a single creature and getting a single bolster out of it every single turn. As I said, I like bolster if it's on something good or if it's repeatable, and this is repeatable bolster. Repeatable bolster. Uh, as well, there are situations where this could be good if you're in a board stall because your opponent has a bunch of walls. You can attack into those walls without any concern. They're not going to attack back, and then your guys just get bigger each turn. So this guy is okay. He's not a C. He's not in the cuttable, I don't really want this card range. He's going to be a B-. minus. I'm not going to look to first pick him. There's probably going to be other cards that I might want over him, but I would take him third, fourth pick maybe, uh, and I'd look to maybe build a, a bit of an Outlast deck or something like that around him. Um, again, I don't think he's a bomb. Uh, I think he is a bit of a more, bit more of a win more card, so I'm just not a huge fan, so I'm going to go with B- minus on this guy. Next up, we have Elite Scale Guard. Four and a white for a creature human soldier at on common. So again, this is a soldier, not a warrior. I'm almost wondering if there's going to be a soldier uh, archetype in uh, con or sorry, dragons of Tarkir, just because there have been so many soldiers. Uh, but anyways, he is a two three for five. That's an expensive two three. So what are his abilities? Well, when he enters the battlefield, you bolster two, and whenever a creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it attacks tap target creature defending player controls this sounds pretty good and i like this guy even slightly more than i like dragon scale general 
uh, because this guy helps you get through. So he's a 2-3 for 5. That's expensive. That's not something I'm going to play by itself. When he comes into play, he bolsters the weakest guy. He might be the weakest guy. I didn't mention that about bolster. If the bolster creature uh, is the lowest toughness creature, it bolsters itself. So if he's a 2-3 and he's the weakest guy, he immediately becomes a 4-5. A 4-5 for 5, that's pretty okay. In an Outlast deck, I think this guy goes absolutely bonkers. Um, because every time you attack with anybody who has a counter on it, you get to tap down some creature of theirs. And so this is going to let you just burst through their blockers. As long as you're not terribly concerned with them attacking back, so as long as they have, you know, only a few creatures, maybe three creatures, or if you have enough blockers that you can hold them back, maybe you have a few archers' parapets or a few walls of some sort, uh, this will really help you burst through if you have an Outlast deck or a Bolster deck or anything like that. So I am pretty happy with this guy. I'm going to give him a B, actually. I'm going to put him pretty high. I would, I think I would take him over Dragon Scale General, maybe. Um, that would be a really tough call for me. But I am pretty happy with this guy. I think you're going to get a lot of use out of him, especially if you build around him. And of course, Fate Reforge is the first pack you're going to be opening, so you're going to be taking this guy first, second, third, fourth pick. And so you're going to know that you're going to want to kind of look towards that Outlast or Bolster mechanic. So I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I'm going to take it relatively highly, and I'm never going to cut it. Um, maybe if I was in the absolute dream aggressive 2-3 drop deck, I would cut him, but uh, otherwise he's going to make my deck every time. All right, so next up we have Great Horn Krushok. Uh, for four and a white, you get a creature beast at common with absolutely no rules text. We have our first vanilla creature, and he is a 3-5. So three fives in white for five have existed in Magic's past. Um, I first remember them as Thraben Purebloods in Innistrad. That was my first uh, draft set that I got into. And they're just not that great. Um, you know, there's just better things going on um, that you want to do at five. These guys are very defensive. They're blockers, yeah, but they're not much else. Um, this guy sort of compares very unfavorably to War Behemoth. Uh, War Behemoth costs six for a three six, uh, but with the morph ability, it only costs four and a white, the exact same as this one. Uh, so you get an extra point of toughness out of War Behemoth. So I would take War Behemoth higher than this guy for sure. The morph ability is huge. Just a vanilla 3-5 five for 5, I don't like it. Uh, I'm going to give it a C-. minus. It's going to be very cuttable. Um, I'm going to play this in decks where I have screwed up, where I have not taken enough creatures or something like that. There may be a situation where I'm up against a really aggressive deck and I think about sideboarding this in, but I'm never really going to be happy about it. I'd prefer to have something else instead of this. Uh, so yeah. Not a big fan of this. I wasn't a big fan of Thraven Pure Bloods. Uh, just not something you're going to want to play. All right, next up we have Honor's Reward. It is two and a white for an instant at Oncommon. And it says, you gain four life. Bolster two. End of story. Nothing else going on with this card. Uh, I really don't like this card. Uh, we talked about Abs and Advantage, which was... Meaningless ability, bolster one. This is basically meaningless ability. Gaining four life. Four is nice, but it's still not going to be all that much when it comes into the grand scheme of things, and especially when it comes to the late game where your opponent's swinging in for five or seven or eight. Uh, four is just not that big of a deal. So this card essentially says bolster two for two and a white. Is bolster two better than bolster one? Well, of course. You know, Bolster 10 is better than Bolster 3. Um, but it's still just Bolster by itself. Again, I'm not a big fan of uh, just straight up Bolster by itself and nothing else. I don't like the ability that I can't choose where it goes. Uh, it's kind of nice that 2 is going to probably make even your worst creature a little bit more of a threat. Maybe even a real threat. 
um, but I'm just not a fan of this. In addition, if you happen to be behind and you don't have any creatures down, this card is dead. This card is absolutely nothing in your hand if you happen to be behind. I would want this card to be basically anything else. So I gave Abzan Advantage a D minus. I'm going to give this a D. I'm going to ever so slightly raise it for Bolster 2, but I still just don't think Bolster 2 is going to be it. I'm definitely uh, perfectly happy to see myself be wrong about Bolster and see it actually be better than I think it is, but I'm just not a fan of uh, uh, not being able to target, and I'm not a fan of Bolster by itself. Next up, we have Jeskai Barricade. Jeskai Barricade is a creature wall for one and a white at on common. It's an 0-4 wall with Defender, as most walls have. In fact, all walls have. And it says, when Jeskai Barricade enters the battlefield, you may return another target creature you control to its owner's hand. And it has flash. So you can do this whenever you want. It's a combat trick creature. So it's an 0-4 wall, which is okay. Um... I've been pretty happy with wall or wall-like things in cons, but they're all O5s. Archer's Parapet, Monastery Flock, Dragon's Eye Savants are O6, and they're even better. They're not even a wall either, uh, which is odd. They can attack uh, in the rare situations where they actually have power. Um, but yeah, the O5s have done a lot of work for me. The O6 is even better. O4 seems a lot worse. Uh, there's a lot of four-power creatures. There's a lot of way to make four power creatures so i don't think an 04 wall is going to live all that long the flash ability does help it a little tiny bit the fact that you can flash it in um, might save you a few points of damage in the early game it's a chump blocker if you need it in the late game the flash ability helps it out a little tiny bit the enter the battlefield effect ability the fact that you can bounce a creature that you control is pretty nice um, and it does say you may return uh, another target creature, so you can't bounce itself, and it won't bounce itself because it is a may ability. So it's not a, it's not a downside. It's not a, it's not a cost of this. It's just a may ability. So you're only going to do it when you really want to. So it could help you dodge some removal. Um, there's a deck that I want to try that I'll talk about in a few days when I review green of just abusing enter the battlefield effects and bouncing uh, things. So maybe this could fit into that deck if it's a thing. Um, but yeah, I'm just not a huge fan of this, as I often am with walls. Um, so I'm going to give it a C plus. The flash does help it out a bit, but the four toughness does hurt it a bit. I'm not going to be looking to take this all that highly. I'm going to be cutting it from uh, uh, probably most of my decks. Uh, if I'm in a grindy deck, I might take this as an early wall that I hope to get backed up by something later on, a War Behemoth, an Archer's Parapet, something like that. So yeah, I'm going to give that a C+. Next up, we have Light Form. Light Form is an enchantment for one white-white, and it's an uncommon. And this is another, uh, I believe, cycle. Um, I think there's five of them. We'll find out later. Uh, and it says, when light form enters the battlefield, it becomes an aura. So it's an enchantment, and then it becomes an enchantment aura uh, with enchant creature. Manifest the top card of your library and attach light form to it. So this is our first instance of manifest. Manifest is a new mechanic for Fate Reforged. It's never appeared before, and it's sort of the ancestor of morph. So the uh, reminder text says, to manifest a card, put it onto the battlefield, face down as a 2-2 creature so it looks like a morph turn it face up anytime for its mana cost if it's a creature card so it's an interesting mechanic and it's one that i'm going to talk about a fair bit uh, as i review these cards uh, but so basically you have your deck and you play this card and you take the top card which you probably don't know what it is and you put it down on the battlefield face down and it's a 2-2 you can look at it, just like with a morph, you can look at it whenever you want, so it's not going to be a surprise. You know what it's going to be. You know it's going to be a Plains, or it's going to be uh, a Mardu Woe Reaper, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or you know it's going to be an Erase. So it could be anything. It could be just a 2-2 creature for its entire life. It could flip up and be something else. Uh, your opponent's not going to know what it is, 
outside of uh, using smoke teller or lens of clarity or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm really confused about manifest. Um, I have to play with it. And so I am going to take any of my ratings with a manifest card with a grain of salt because I'm currently kind of down on it. Um, I really don't like the gambling aspect of it. I, I really don't like the pure randomness of what that card might be. It's always going to be a 2-2. But in the worst case scenario, it's going to be my removal spell that I really need, and it's stuck for the entire game as a 2-2. I can never cast that spell. Uh, on the best case scenario, it's going to be an awesome creature that I get to turn up and surprise somebody with. Um, yeah, I'm just, a no, I'm just not a fan of the variance that exists with Manifest, so I need to play with it. I have a feeling it's probably a little bit better than I'm giving it credit for. It could be a lot better than I'm giving it credit for, but I'm going to be cautious with it. So anyways, Light Form, when you play it, you manifest the top card of your library, and you put Manifest on it. Light Form, or sorry, you put Light Form on it. Uh, it's a Manifest creature. Lightform says Enchanted Creature has Flying and Lifelink. So that means that for one white white, you're getting a Flying Lifelinking 2-2. And that I'm pretty okay with. Um, I will forego the variance to get a 2-2 Flying Lifelink that uh, maybe could be better. So for example, let me just look through my uh, cons cards I have sitting here. Uh, let's say that uh, I manifest the top card and it's now a flying lifelinking 2-2. And I take a look at that card, and I see underneath, it's a seeker of the way. So this card is a flying lifelinking 2-2 as long as I want it. But at any point, I can pay one and a white and flip it up, and it's a seeker of the way. And it's now a 2-2 flying lifelink seeker of the way with prowess that would get double lifelink, which wouldn't do all that much. Um, but yeah, it's it's... It's going to be interesting. It could be really good. It could be really bad. Uh, but with this specific card, I'm pretty happy getting a 2-2 Flying Lifelinker that might be a bigger Flying Lifelinker. Flying is huge. Flying is the best kind of evasion. Um, well, maybe purely unblockable is the best kind of evasion, but flying is the best evergreen evasion. So I'm pretty happy with this card. I'm not terribly concerned about the... Uh, uh, the possibility of getting the removal pulled off or getting the enchantment pulled off of it. Um, so I'm going to take this relatively highly. I'm going to give it a B minus. It's not going to be a first pick, but it's going to be a pretty high pick for me, I think. Um, if Manifest really is that powerful, I could push this up to a B. Maybe a B plus, but I doubt it. Um, but yeah, it really remains to see how Manifest is going to uh, really shake out. As it stands, I'm hesitant about it, and you'll see that in a lot of my manifest ratings. Next up, we have Lotus Eye Mystics. It's an uncommon creature human monk for three and a white, and it's a 3-2. It has prowess. Uh, I guess I haven't talked about prowess. I, I just assumed you all know prowess. Prowess, of course, is whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Prowess is the returning Jeskai mechanic from uh, Cons of Tarkir. Lotus Eye Mystics also says, when Lotus Eye Mystics enters the battlefield, return target enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. So if you have an enchantment card sitting in your graveyard, you get it back. And they also have prowess. As I've already talked about, I'm not a prowess fan. Um, I just feel like prowess, in order for it to be any good, you have to really actively hurt yourself uh, in your deck construction. And I just don't want to do that. You know, the removal that I want to play, or the, the, the non-creature spells that I want to play are usually going to be instants, which means I'm not really going to care about the prowess trigger. Uh, in a lot of scenarios, they're, it's just going to be removal or something like that. Um, so I'm just not a big fan of prowess, so I may as well just not have prowess on this card. The enchantment recursion, that's not really all that exciting either. Um, you know... Maybe I could recur a Siege that was destroyed, but a Siege is a rare, so I'm not going to see that all that often. I'm more likely going to be maybe recurring an Aura, and most Auras I don't want to play anyways. Uh, maybe I could re uh, recur Light Form. That would be cool, but it uh, just doesn't seem all that great. So essentially, I'm looking at this guy as being a 3-2 for 4, which isn't all that good. Uh, so I'm going to give it a... 
I'll give it a C just because the prowess and the enchantment recursion in the times that they might be okay will pull this out of C minus territory. Um, but I'm not looking to take this guy all that highly at all. And I'm not looking to uh, uh, be really married to this guy. I will cut him if need be. Um, yeah, just a, a straight up kind of C, I think. Next up, we have Mardu Woe Reaper. This is a creature human warrior for one white at Oncommon. And it's a 2-1. So uh, one white, 2-1 human warrior. That sounds actually pretty decent as far as uh, Black White Warriors has been concerned so far. So he says, whenever Mardu Woe Reaper or another warrior enters the battlefield under your control, you may exile target creature card from a graveyard. If you do, gain one life. That's not all that concerning for me. Um, there's not really all that much graveyard recursion being played. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen people play Dutiful Return maybe once, so I don't terribly care about getting a creature out of their graveyard. I don't terribly care about gaining one life here or there. So I'm really looking at this as a 2-1 warrior for one. And a 2-1 warrior for one is perfectly okay. Um, in an aggro deck, it's fantastic. I would love to see this guy in Mardu. I would love to see this guy in Black White Warriors, of course. Um, so I'm going to give it a C+. Um, it seems perfectly okay. Uh, it could be cut. You know, there are definitely two drops that are better than this guy. Definitely three drops that are better than this guy. Um, I would probably... Well, no, I would definitely cut this guy for a Mardu Hateblade and some other one drops. So this guy is just sort of good but nothing terribly special the ability i just don't think is really much of a concern to me and it's not going to really bounce this up uh the warrior sub or the warrior creature type really bounces this up to a c plus for me much more than the uh, uh the written words on the card next up we have mastery of the unseen it's an enchantment for one and a white at rare and it says whenever a permanent you control is turned face up you gain one life for each creature you control. So if you have manifest cards down that are creatures, or if you have morph cards down, uh, every time you flip one of those up, you get one life for each of the creatures that you control. That's kind of cool. Life gain is uh, you know, not something you want to look for, but if it's repeatable uh, over the course of a game, it might be a little bit better. This also has another ability. This is an enchantment that just sits on the battlefield. So it has an ability that says three white, Manifest the top card of your library. So this is repeatable life gain, and it's repeatable manifest. So again, I'm super hesitant about manifest. I feel kind of like bolster. It's going to be better if it's repeatable. I don't really terribly care for the cards that we will see that are just manifest. Um, but being on top of something else, I like a little bit more. Again, this card really kind of depends on the power of Manifest. Um, you're paying four mana for a 2-2. Two -two, but you can do it whenever you want. You can do it at instant speed. You can do it during combat. You can do it to make a surprise blocker, etc. So I can see the value in that for sure. And of course, you will sometimes get something extra out of it. You'll get to surprise your opponent with a creature. Um, there will also be times where a land that you would not have wanted to draw becomes a 2-2 creature, and that's going to be a pretty awesome feeling. There's also going to be times where it's going to be the removal spell that you needed. Um, people have compared Manifest to self-milling, and self-milling is pretty good uh, in a lot of cases, especially with Delve in this set. And the feel-bad moment of milling away your super awesome card that you really needed. But the important thing to keep in mind with that is that there was an equal chance of milling away something else that wasn't that super awesome card that you needed. And Manifest is kind of the same way. Um, there are some ways that we'll see later to bounce the cards back to your hand. So if it is the super important removal spell that you need, you can get it back to your hand in a few ways. Uh, even Jeskai Barricade does that. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm really hesitant about it. I'm going to have to play with Manifest to really feel the true power. And that's really going to decide the final, final, final rating of this card. At the moment, I have it at a C-. And that's my cautious rating. 
because uh, this card does take up a card slot in your deck and it doesn't do anything by itself. You have to then pump more mana into it in order to start making those two twos. If Manifest is really good, I think this will bounce up to, I don't know, a C plus maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be cautious with Manifest to start. Uh, repeatable Manifest I'll be a little bit more uh, happy with or... Uh, uh, concurrent manifest, manifest with something else I'll be a little bit more happy about. But yeah, I'm going to put this at a C-, minus, but that is a very tentative grade. Next up we have Monastery Mentor. So Monastery Mentor is two and a white for a creature human monk at Mythic. So this is our first Mythic rare. Monastery Monk says Prowess. So it has Prowess. It also says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a 1-1 white monk creature token with prowess onto the battlefield. It's not often that a creature token gets uh, a mechanic ability. They'll usually get flying or trample or some sort of evergreen mechanic, but it's rare for them to actually get a set mechanic. Uh, and I, I don't think I mentioned that it's also a 2-2. So it's a 2-2 for 3 that uh, as you play non-creature spells, it pumps out 1-1s that will grow with further non-creature spells. Unfortunately, I don't like this guy. Um, I don't like him very much. Uh, that's going to get a lot of hate, I'm sure. This is pre-ordering for, I think, 20 or $30, but that is for Constructed. Constructed? This thing's going to be insane. Uh, Jeskai Tokens? This card's going to be insane, I'm sure. In Limited, I don't terribly like it, and it's the exact same reason I don't like Prowess. It's that if you're filling your deck full of non-creature spells you're not filling your deck full of creatures. And if you're not filling your deck full of creatures, you're not going to win in limited. So I'm not super happy with this card. That said, it's an expensive mythic rare. I'm never passing it. Uh, if I happen to suddenly appear on the Pro Tour, maybe I'll pass it. Uh, you know, because winning thirty dollars or $40,000 is probably more important than a $30 card. But at FNM, at my local store, on Magic Online, I'm taking this card first pick, just purely at a value. Um, but as far as playing it goes, it's not something I'm super looking forward to. Um, I just don't want to jam my deck full of instants and sorceries uh, and auras and other non-creature spells. Especially because a lot of aura, well, all auras, obviously, but uh, a lot of instant and sorceries need a creature to target. And if you're playing less creatures, you're not going to have them in order to target them. So I just think that taking this too highly will hurt your deck. Um, but again, it's a mute, moot point because it's going to be such an expensive card. So play-wise, I'm going to give this, uh, I think, a B. Uh, just because I don't like prowess. I don't like jamming my deck full of non-creature spells. Value-wise, A+. Plus, take this card. Pay for your draft. Pay for the next draft. Um, don't look back. <laughs> Next up, we have Pressure Point. Pressure Point is one and a white for an instant at common. It says tap target creature, period. Draw a card, period. That's it. The majority of this card is uh, flavor text. So this is kind of like Crippling Chill for one mana less. Uh, but Crippling Chill is so much better. The frosty ability of Crippling Chill, which is tap and it doesn't untap until then, uh, or it doesn't untap on your opponent's next turn, is so much better than tap for the time being. So this replaces itself, which is okay, but the fact that it's just tap for right now seems pretty bad. It's essentially fogging one creature um, on defense. On offense, if you need a single creature tapped down in order to break through, you probably should have been able to break through already. You were going to break through anyways, or you could play any creature and that would help you break through instead of this card. The fact that it does replace itself is okay, um, and that's going to keep it at a D range for me, but I am going to give it a C-. minus. I will very readily cut this card. I'm never going to look to take this card. Uh, Crippling Chill has even gone down a little bit, from where I originally valued it. I originally valued it fairly highly. Um, so with Crippling Chill going down a little bit in my valuation, this card's going to drop even further. So I'm going to give it a pretty solid C-. Next up, we have another rare, Rally the Ancestors. 
uh, white white X for an instant rare. And it says return each creature card with converted mana cost X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Exile those creatures at the beginning of your next upkeep. Exile Rally the Ancestors. So if you pay five mana for this, you're going to pay white, white, three, which means that you're going to get every single one, two, and three drop in your graveyard back on the battlefield for one turn. Very, very important note about this. In the notes that I have written uh, for this card, I didn't notice this. So many people haven't noticed this. The creatures don't get haste. This is not an offense card. This is not how you win. You're going to get those creatures back, and they are going to sit there until they get exiled again. They are not ever going to attack. Ever. So this is not an offensive, aha, you thought I had no creatures, now I do, you lose. This is, oh no, I'm being attacked. Here's a wall of creatures you thought were dead, and now they're dead again. Or exiled. This is a fog. This is a bad fog because it may not even fog uh, properly. Maybe you'll get back enough creatures to kill one of theirs. Maybe they somehow board wiped just your board and you'll actually be able to get back enough to wipe their board and be still left without a board. Um, but at least they won't have a board. But those situations are going to be far few and far between. This seems like a bad conditional fog to me. This is going to be the rare that I'm going to open, and I'm going to go, oh, I don't want this card. This is the rare that's going to make me first pick a common <laughs> from a pack. I don't like this card. I'm going to give it a solid, solid F. If you can find a way to do something crazy with this, awesome. Uh, maybe it could have a cool place in Commander with a ton of Enter the Battlefield effects and things like that. But limited, I'm not going to touch this card. I never want to play this card. All right, next up we have Sage's Reverie. It is three and a white for an enchantment aura at Uncommon. It says enchant creature, as all auras do. When Sage's Reverie enters the battlefield, draw a card for each creature you control that's attached to a creature. So you draw a card for every aura you already have. Uh, generally, your auras are going to be attached to a creature. Uh, maybe you have an enchant land or something like that. Enchanted creature also gets plus one plus one for each aura you control that's attached to a creature. So this is an aura that wants you to be playing a whole bunch of other auras. That is not something you do in limited. In limited you play an aura. Maybe two if they're really good. You don't play a bunch of auras because the more auras you're playing, the less creatures you're playing, the less targets you have for those creatures, the less way you have of actually winning the game. This is a constructed card. This is meant to go in the, uh, you know, the aura deck. Uh, probably meant to be paired with uh, Bestow from Theros. Uh, but in Limited, in Cons Limited, or sorry, Fate Reforged Limited, this is an F. Don't take this card. Don't play this card. Uh, it's just not good. Next up, we have Sandblast. Sandblast is two and a white instant at common, and it says Sandblast deals five damage to target attacking or blocking creature. I love this card. This seems like very solid, very cheap white removal. White removal often has an annoying restriction, uh, like uh, kill shot, destroy target attacking creature. Uh, Avenging arrow, destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. Or sorry, dealt damage this turn. Um, there's always something that makes it one-sided. This card's not one-sided. You can't do it whenever you want. But you can do it on offense or you can do it on defense, which is a bit better than white usually gets. Five damage is going to kill almost everything in this format. It's going to kill everything except for the biggest of the dragons. It's going to kill everything except for dragon's eye savants. It's going to kill every wall below that. It's going to kill a lot of things. This seems really powerful. Uh, at common, especially, this is going to be the common that I'm going to take when I get uh, when I open up Rally the Ancestors. Uh, of course, if there's no other better uh, on common. 
but this seems great. I'm going to put it at a B minus. Um, this there seems to be one common per color that is totally first pickable, and I think this is the first pickable uh, white common. Of course, better rares you'll take over this. Better on commons you'll take over this, but this just seems fantastic. Next up, we have Sandstep Outcast. It's two and a white for a creature human warrior at common. Uh, and this is a cycle. There are five cards like this. Uh, when Sandstep Outcast enters the battlefield, choose one. So you get to choose uh, what's going to happen when this guy enters the battlefield. Choice is a, uh, a sub-theme of Fate Reforged. So this entire cycle of creatures has the same first ability, which is put a plus one plus one counter on Sandstep Outcast. Sandstep Outcast is a 2-1 by itself. If you put a counter on it, it's a 3-2. So uh, each creature, Hooded Assassin in black, I can't remember the other ones for the other colors, they all have the possibility of being plus one plus one more than they are. Or if you don't want that counter, you can get a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield. This seems pretty okay. Uh, it has the warrior sub, uh, sorry, not sub, uh, character type which creature type rather which uh, is obviously relevant as we've seen in cons and uh ignoring the second choice it's a three two for three uh a three two for three warrior seems totally okay for me uh if you have chief of the e or chief of the scale it's going to be a three three chief of the edge it's a four two for four or four two for three seems totally okay with me it battles with morphs nicely uh having the option for a spirit if you need it is pretty good uh you know if it's late game and a 3-2 is not really going to do much for you. You can put down that 1-1 one, one if they don't have any flyers, and you can just start pinging them in the air. Uh, you could even pair this with Bolster. So if you have this card and you have a Bolster card, you can play this guy, make a Spirit, and then Bolster, and Bolster is almost definitely going to hit that Spirit and make it an even bigger flyer. It just seems pretty solid to me. Uh, I actually give this guy a B-. Uh, I'm going to play him in probably every white deck I play. Uh, he just seems quite solid black white warriors definitely gonna play him next up we have soul summons soul summons is a one white sorcery at common and it says manifest the top card of your library that's it it's the first and purest uh manifest card that we have so you get a 2-2 colorless creature for two that's a bear bears are always okay now, I have seen a lot of people talking about Manifest as well and saying that 2-2s two for 2 are amazing. You love 2-2s two for 2, but they talk about them as though they would play a deck that had 30 2-2s two for 2, and you wouldn't play that. It just wouldn't do anything. Um, you know, you would have to have something more past those 2-2s. Two 2-2s two two twos for 2s are awesome on turn 2. They're good on turn 3. They're all right on turn 4. Later in the game, they become terrible. Nobody wants to play Grizzly Bears on turn 9. Nobody wants that. So I'm not really sold on the fact that manifests are bears and bears are fantastic. Bears are good at a specific part of the game. So this is manifest, which means it doesn't necessarily have to be a bear. It could be something more. It could be a surprise creature that you get to turn up and have an awesome effect happen and really mess up combat. It could be a land that you really didn't want to draw, uh, and now you got rid of that land and you have something better on top. But this is the purest of the manifest cards, and this is the purest of my complete caution towards the manifest uh, mechanic. I'm really nervous about the variance of it. I'm going to have to play with this card. Right now I'm going to put it at a C-. I don't really want to play this just because I'm kind of afraid of the variance. I will give it a go. Uh, a 2-2 two, two for 2 is fine on turn 2. Uh, it goes down from there. Uh, but I will take this, I will play it, I will readily cut it. If Manifest is truly amazing, maybe this is actually a little bit better. But we'll see how it goes. Next up is Soulfire Grand Master. It's one and a white for a creature human monk at Mythic Rare. So this is our second white Mythic. Uh, there are two Mythics for each color. So this is a 2-for-2, two two for two, which we just talked about is totally okay on turn 2 and a little bit less good on later turns, unless they do something, and this does something. This has lifelink. A 2-for-2 two 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 lifelink seems fantastic. I would love a 2-for-2 two 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 lifelink to be a regular thing, but it's definitely not going to be. This is a, a very low-costed creature for what it does. 
But it doesn't just doesn't just do lifelink. It also says instant and sorcery spells you control have lifelink. Uh, I believe this is the first time this has ever happened. Sorceries and instants have not had lifelink before, but now they do. So if you arrow storm your opponent for five, you gain five. That is incredible. Uh, and that's not all. This thing has more stuff on it. Uh, she also says pay two uh, is it is it. So two blue or red, blue or red. The next time you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand this turn, put that card into your hand instead of into your graveyard as it resolves. So if I cast Aerostorm, three red red, and I pay an extra two red red, which is starting to be a pretty expensive Aerostorm, uh, we're looking at five, we're looking at nine mana for that Aerostorm, uh, I will be able to hit something for four or five, gain four or five life, and bring it back to my hand to do it again. Probably next turn. I don't think I'm going to have 18 mana. This card sounds pretty fantastic in Constructed. Um, this has the exact same prowess disclaimer of the more instants and sorceries you put into your uh, deck, the weaker it gets. You know, you want to be playing 14 creatures on the low end, 16, 17 on the high end. That doesn't leave a whole lot of spaces for instants and sorceries to be getting lifelink, to be doing crazy stuff with you. So I'm not super sold on that. The, the rebuy, sorry, I just hit the mute button on my microphone there. The, the rebuy is all right. It's a little bit expensive, but you could rebuy some really fun things. You could rebuy uh, Kill Shot. That would be awesome. Rebuy uh, Sandblast. That would be pretty awesome. Sandblast with Lifelink. That sounds really awesome. Um, so I think some really cool things can be done with this even with a lowish number of instants and sorceries. Barring all of that, it's a 2-2 lifelinker for two, and I'm pretty okay with that. Um, so I'm actually going to give this an A-, minus, despite all that disclaimer, despite all the hesitancy about throwing a lot of instants and sorceries into your deck. I think this just gives you enough that you want to play this, that this will do something good in your deck. Um, obviously, you want to pair this with red. You want to pair this with Aerostorm. You want to pair this with the Shock that we'll talk about. You want to pair this with, um, I don't know, Barrage of Boulders. If you were sideporting that in against tokens, that would be quite a life gain. You want to side or pair this with uh, uh, Bring Low, Burn Away, etc. Uh, as well, this is a mythic that's going to be super, super, super constructed, playable from what I'm seeing, from what I feel just myself, uh, my my uninformed opinion of constructed and it's pre-selling for quite a bit of money so you're going to take it anyways um, but unlike monastery monk which i'm not super excited about playing in my deck but i will take for value this i'm excited about playing in my deck and will take for value so soulfire grandmaster uh that's my uh probably highest rated card for white um both from value and from uh play perspective only a couple more cards to go. We have Valorous Stance. Valorous Stance is one and a white for an instant at uncommon, and it's another choice card. It says, choose one. Target creature gains indestructible until end of turn, or destroy target creature with toughness four or greater. Uh, there was a great conversation on limited resources about uh, one of the few negatives about Concept Tark here is that toughness and power matter for a lot of cards and there's no consistency about it so i myself need to remember and i hope all of you remember valorous stance is toughness four or greater don't go try casting this on zergo zergo does not have four toughness he has two toughness um same thing has happened with me with uh smite the monstrous smite the monstrous is power not toughness i have tried to kill uh an abomination of gadul doesn't work so keep that in mind. But anyways, this card is fantastic. Uh, it is so cheaply costed. One in a white for indestructible is awesome. Uh, it's right up there with God's Willing and Feet of Resistance. Um, Feet of Resistance, of course, probably being a little tiny bit better because you get that counter. Um, but one white for indestructible is very nice. Or one white for killing a big thing of theirs. Um, so, you know, you're not going to kill any of the really lopsided things like Zergo. But any of the 6-6s, six any of the 5-5s, five um, 
you know, any walls, even if you need them dead, can be killed with this thing for such a cheap cost. Uh, this gets an A- minus for me. Uh, I'm going to be taking this first pick over weak rares all the time. Uh, I'm going to be second picking this all the time. This card seems really, really, really good, and both of the modes are really, really good as well. Next up, we have Wandering Champion. Wandering Champion is one and a white for a creature human monk at Uncommon. And it says, whenever Wandering Champion deals combat damage to a player, if you control a red or blue permanent, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. This is a cycle as well. There's a cycle of creatures at Uncommon that care about uh, whether or not you have a permanent of the other two colors, just like the rune marks. So Wandering Champion, it's a 3-1 as well, I forgot to mention that. So it's a 3-1 for 2, which is always okay. Uh, Oresco Swiftclaw in Theros, fantastic card, I loved that. In aggro decks, that did a lot of work. Uh, so if you're Jeskai, or even if you're not Jeskai, if you are white-red, if you're white-blue, if you are in Mardu, this works, um, and you have an appropriate permanent down, then you get to Rummage. Uh, rummaging, of course, is less than looting. You have to discard a card before you draw it. So maybe you discard that planes and you draw a planes. Well, at least you filtered it, I suppose. Um, but it's always uh, less good than looting. Looting, of course, you get to draw a card and then you get to just throw away the worst card. If the card you drew was the worst, throw it back. So rummaging, not quite awesome. If this was looting, this card would be super good. Uh, but with it being rummaging, I'm going to drop this to a B minus. As I said, uh, a 3-1 for 2 is great. If you throw this in an aggro deck, it's going to do a lot of work. Uh, it is a monk, thankfully. Uh, I would not want to see this as a warrior. Uh, <laughs> just because it would be bad in Mardu Warriors. It would be so harsh uh, to be facing down this 3-1 for 2. But yeah, 3-1 for 2 with the potential of rummaging. B-, minus. I'm pretty happy to take this relatively highly and then go a sort of a aggressive base white deck maybe throwing in blue. Blue looks a little bit more aggressive in this set, uh, which is good because it was not aggressive at all in the last set. And red, of course, is super aggressive. All right, last card of white. We have Ward Scale Dragon. Four white white for a creature dragon at Uncommon. Dragons are back in Fate Reforged because we've gone back in time, back to when they're still there, back to when Ugin is still alive. This is a cycle as well. There is a cycle of Uncommon Dragons for every color that each cost four color color. This is the white one. Uh, so it's a 4-4 flyer. Dragons fly, of course. Uh, and it says, as long as uh, Ward Scale Dragon is attacking, defending player can't cast spells. So as soon as you get to declare attackers and you declare Ward Scale Dragon as an attacker, your opponent can't cast anything else until you get back to uh, main phase number two. That's okay. You know, all that does is turn off combat tricks. All that does is mean that uh, uh, your opponent's going to need to cast things in the uh, beginning of combat step, or they're going to need to hold them for some other time. It'll stop some things. It'll, uh, you know, it'll save you a couple of times here or there, but the times that it's not going to do anything are going to be far more prevalent, I think. So really, I'm just looking at this as a 4-4 four, four flyer for 6. Uh, and not only that, but six double color. I'm a little bit hesitant on these uncommon dragons. Uh, I've seen seen some people just absolutely loving them, saying they are total and utter limited bombs. I'm not as convinced. I don't like the double color. Um, I've seen people giving these A's. I've seen people giving them high B's. This one, in sp this one specifically, I'm going to give a C to. Um, I absolutely see the power. Flyers are good, big flyers are even better, um, but I see problems. The double color is definitely one of those problems. Um, I, of course, don't care for the ability on this specific dragon. Some of the other dragons do have better abilities, thankfully. Um, and there are things that block this. You know, a lot of people look at uh, cons and they say, oh, there was no way to block the dragons, but there are. There's a lot of ways. Uh, Monastery Flock blanks this dragon. Sagu Archer blanks this dragon. There's stuff in this set that blanks this dragon. Uh, there's a lot of ways to block flyers. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of the uncommon dragons. If they were single color, I would love them. Uh, at double color, I'm a little bit more hesitant. That being said, I'm still going to pick this guy 
relatively highly. Um, if I'm already going white, it's not going to be a first pick for me. Uh, it's not going to be probably second or third pick or fourth. Um, but if I see it starting to get towards my opening pack coming back to me, I would probably consider taking it. So it's a C. It's cuttable even. If my deck is really leaning low, I'm not going to play a sixth drop with two colors. Um, it just seems sort of okay. We'll talk about the other dragons later on this week. Uh, there are some that I like more. There are some that I like a little bit less. Uh, but yeah, I'm just I'm cautious about these dragons. Uh, I want to be proven wrong, of course. I love seeing big giant dragon flyers in Limited. Uh, but we'll see if it's truly good or not. And that wraps it up for the white set review. Uh, overall, white seems uh, pretty okay. It looks like there's going to be a lot of things added to the Warriors deck, of course. Uh, I'm very excited about Sandblast. Uh, that's probably going to be the common that I'm most excited to play. Uh, on common wise, I'm not sure which one I'm most excited to play. Um, taking a quick look here, I don't think there's any I'm truly, truly, truly excited to play. I'm maybe Wandering Champion, I suppose, or Valorous Stance, of course. Uh, I'm really looking to open a Soulfire Grandmaster or the Monastery Monk just for value, and I don't want to see Rally the Ancestors ever at all. I will rip that card up. I will take it first pick just to rip it up. But anyways, that's white. Hopefully you enjoyed this set review. We are going to have set reviews every day this week. Monday will be blue. Tuesday will be black. Wednesday will be red. Thursday will be green. Friday will be artifacts. The single colorless card in this set that is not an artifact. Uh, lands and gold cards, as well as probably some closing statements and things like that hopefully you enjoyed this if you have any questions comments suggestions you want to disagree on a card etc you can let me know in the comments below of course you can also find me on twitter at the manaleek that's l-e-e-k like the vegetable not the card you can also find me on facebook at facebook.com slash the manaleek and you found me here on youtube already as always if you like the videos you can click that little thumbs up icon uh, if you want to subscribe to the videos, that would be a great idea. Uh, click subscribe and you will get notice whenever a video goes up. You will get notice every day when these set reviews go up. You'll get notice when we're back to our regular schedule with actual magic being played. Uh, and of course, it also helps me reach more viewers. As always, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow for uh, the blue set review.